Good morning. Welcome to Trading R. I'm Reema Tendulkar. With me is Sonal Butra. Butra. And now, Sonal, it's looking like not such a bad morning, yeah. right? In the morning when we woke up, you know, we were staring at deep gashes across Wall Street on Friday. Uh, Asian markets were under pressure. In fact, nearing a near 3% cut on some of those indices. But in the morning, we had that big slam dunk at about 9.30. The Nifty went on to hit lows of about, uh, you know, I think about 24,750. Approximately, that was the low. And since then, there's been a recovery. First, between 9.30 and 9.45. And again, in the last 30 minutes, markets have picked up. And now we're back towards that uh, uh, closer to 24,900. Asian markets still continue to remain under pressure. Hang Seng is down nearly about 2%. And sectorally, it's the FMCG names which are fighting for the bulls, you know, aiding that recovery. So names like Tata Consumer, Britannia, HUL, ITC up and about in the green. IT2 is managing a positive tick. Uh, and banks have pulled up. So pull up the Nifty Banking Index about 20 minutes back before the second leg of recovery. The Nifty Bank was pretty much flat and now it's up 200 points. Hi. Yes. Uh, hey, uh, Rima. And you know, this is something uh, which is pushing the Nifty higher, of course, and lending some support. But what's not doing well is the Nifty CPSC index. Uh, just pull that uh, index up for you. It is the top loser right now. It's down 1.8%. And a lot of these constituents which are not doing well, so talk about an ONGC, Beat Coal India, PFC, REC, the other big PSU names, they are lower in trade. PFC, for instance, is down 5%. We have ONGC, which is declining by around 4%. And the other names will come up for you on the screen as well. Across the board, we are seeing big cuts when it comes to the uh, PSC index uh, and uh, that is something which is putting some pressure. But of course, as Reema pointed out, there has been a massive recovery from the lows. We'll have to see whether that sustains or not. But with that, let's uh, move ahead and welcome the first management of the show, Dream Folk Services. The travel and lifestyle experiences company announced foray into highway dining for travellers. The service is to be available at over 600 outlets along key highways across the country. Members of Dream Folks can now have specially designed meals at popular restaurants on more than 60 highway routes from major cities, including Delhi, Mumbai, Bengaluru, Hyderabad, Chennai and Kolkata. To discuss the impact of this and a lot more, we are joined by Liberta Peter Kalik, the chairperson and MD at Dream Folks. Liberta, good morning. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, well, it's an interesting uh, expansion that the company has uh, gone into. Can you explain to us what kind of investments will you be making here? What the impact of this expansion be on your balance sheet and PNL as well, of course. Good morning. Uh, so as you know that you know our business is an asset light business, right? So in terms of investment, I would say that you know uh, the only investment is about the technology what we actually have to uh, you know uh, invest. So as such, there is no such uh, I would say uh, investment required for this. Uh, in terms of uh, the benefit, I would say that you know if you have actually seen the way we have uh, added different set of services in the travel uh, in terms of the airport services then again in railways so this is one of the uh, uh, you know i would say uh the entry into highways because we feel that you know uh, the way the government has initiated and if you actually see in terms of the uh, infrastructure as well the way it has changed and uh, also now with the uh, av stations coming in so yes uh, you know we see a huge opportunity there and we also have seen that yes there is a huge interest as well from our existing set of clients who would want to offer this benefits to their consumers uh, Libata, hi. Uh, morning. This is Reema here. Can you give us a breakup of your current revenues? How much comes from airports? Uh, how much from railways, visa application centers, highways? And what exactly is the kind of work that you will be doing for highways? And is there any kind of synergy? So, Rima, yes, the majority of our revenue is from, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the airport. airport. And uh, the major contributor, of course, is the lounge. But however, if I have to actually talk about the other services as well, I would say that, you know, from uh, 2022 uh, to now, I mean, we have actually uh, grown. So the contribution from the other services, which were hardly 2%, now the other services have started contributing nearly around 8%. So I would say that is the growth in the other services. Uh, in terms of uh, railways, I would say that right now the numbers are uh, pretty small in compared to what the airport lounges are. But uh, I would say that, you know, the way it is growing, it is actually growing uh, month on month uh, around uh, more than 50% right now. 
Okay. Uh, so just to get the numbers right, non-airport lounge business is about 92% uh, of your revenues today. Uh, is 8% of your revenues, right? 8%. Versus 2% yes. about in 2022. And this yes. business and this non-lounge non airport business uh, includes railways, highways and uh, visa application center. Is that correct? Uh, it, it majorly uh, actually it's meet and assist services at the airport. Then you also have the spas, the airport transfer, the golf. So these are the services which actually contribute. Okay. Uh, can you give us a sense of what the take rates would be like in the highway dining center versus the current, uh, the bigger business that you have? I just wanted to understand the margin profile of this new expansion that you'll be making. So the take rate would be, uh, you know, I would say 50% to what the airport lounges are. Uh, or maybe 50 to 60 percent, I would say, less than uh, the airport uh, lounge rates. Uh, in terms of the margins, I would say that, you know, we will try and maintain uh, a similar margin. But yes, the other services compared uh, to the airport lounges would be at a higher margins. Have you assessed uh, the total addressable market for this new offering of yours catering to highways? What's the tap? Uh, see, uh, right now, actually, if you look at it, you know that uh, we are, uh, you know, focusing more on the bank cards. So obviously, you know, it's around 100 million uh, credit cards which are under circulation. And in terms of the usage, if you actually look at uh, even the airport services, what we are presently doing, uh, it's around only, uh, I would say, you know, 4% is what the usage is. So I would say that, you know, right now the focus is more on the uh, credit and the debit card. So I would say that would be the focus market for us. No, uh, sorry, I was asking about this current, uh, you know, new venture that you've gotten into, catering to highways. What is the total addressable market or the opportunity size? So I would say the opportunity size, uh, which, uh, you know, I think uh, the report also had come uh, for 2019, it was around 1.7 billion. And uh, it is growing at a CAGR of 20% year on year. And that is what is, uh, you know, I would say that uh, the addressable market is. Okay. Uh, Liberta, I wanted to understand the guidance that you've given for FY25. Does it uh, take into consideration this expansion that you've made or you would like to revise it upwards? Or by when do you expect contribution to come in meaningfully from the highway dining? So obviously highway was already a plan and you know when we actually gave the projection this was already considered because uh, this was uh, a plan what we wanted to do it. Uh, as we always mentioned that you know uh, that uh, all these services would start contributing in a larger scale in next two to three years. So I would say that, you know, around 20 to 25% of, uh, uh, you know, the other uh, services contribution would be to the top line. So, yeah, in terms of, uh, you know, absolute value, I mean, uh, in, uh, if I have to talk about the percentage, yes, it would be around 20 to 25% uh, on the top line in next uh, two to three years. Okay. okay, and your FY25 guidance, 20% top line growth, gross margins 11 to 13%, EBITDA margins 7 to 9%. Do you maintain that? Yes, we'll maintain the same. Okay, okay. all right, Libata, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining in today and uh, letting us know everything about these new uh, segment plans and the outlook going forward as well. It's time to slip into a break. When we come back, we'll discuss what's buzzing in the commodity space with Manisha Gupta. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Still tuned into Trading R. It's a 40-point uptick on the Nifty that we are looking at right now. Mid-caps continue to sulk, though the advanced decline ratio, it has improved in favor of advances. Uh, still around 1,400 stocks on the advancing side on the BSC, but the declines are at around 2,500 stocks. So watch out for that one. Uh, there has been some recovery from the lows on the Nifty, but we'll have to see whether that sustains or not. And of course, so we have that big event. The GST uh, Council meet is underway, and we'll be getting updates soon. Our colleague, uh, Tim C. Jaipuria has been getting us all the updates which are expected from there. There are a lot of items on the agenda as well, be it with respect to insurance premiums, be it with the highway infra uh, uh, and a lot more as well. 
So that is something that we will be tracking for you very, very closely. But um, for now, we will also be talking about a lot of stocks that will be in focus. Um, IEX is, is one of them. It is in focus on the back of positive commentary from UBS. Vivek Iyer is here to tell us more. Vivek. Well, that's right. So, you know, very interesting note from UBS today morning as far as IEX is concerned. What they've done is they've gone ahead and maintained a buy stance and they raised the target price quite significantly, almost a 30% hike from where they were earlier. So now the target price is 260 from the earlier 200 rupees a share. What is it that is actually going ahead and making their stance even more favorable or more positive than it was earlier? Number one, that they say that improved volumes as far as IEX, which the company has been delivering in the last few months, they believe that this upward momentum can sustain. Along with that, RTM as well as green products, as well as the long duration contracts, you know, all of these newer products of IX have actually seen very, very sharp growth in the last few months. Uh, UPS believes that this can sustain, especially as far as the renewable energy certificates is concerned. Uh, now, the other key overhang as far as IX is concerned has been the implementation of market coupling. While this particular overhang, according to UPS, has not completely ceased, they believe the likelihood of implementation is a lot lower now. Uh, remember the regulatory authority, that is CRC, uh, has directed Grid India to develop a software and run simulations uh, to go ahead and see the viability of market coupling. But so far, there has not been too much progress that has been made indicating that market coupling, if it is implemented, is still quite some time ahead. So what they're saying is that the market right now is not fully priced in potential growth acceleration in trading volumes, largely driven by the green product segment. Thank you very much uh, for that. As promised, let's now talk commodities. Manisha is now joining in and she's got her eye on gold. Manisha. <laughs> Thank you for that, Rima. Well, today's a day when you have most of the metal prices trading in the negative. You have aluminum at two-month lows, iron ore at one-year lows, and that's exactly what we have seen in the precious metal prices. Also, silver prices fell 3% on Friday, and if you look at the gold prices, we were down by more than half a percent in the previous week as well. Importantly, on charts, it has been making lower lows, so $2,500 an ounce has broken on the lower side here. There's one major reason for that, and that is that the U.S. non-farm payroll data came in much weaker at 142,000 uh, than what the street was anticipating and that tells you that perhaps 25 basis points of a rate cut uh, will what is what you'll see on 18th of September that is when the US Fed meeting is there also the speed the size of rate cuts going forward the guidance that is something that the markets will keep a keen eye on in the Indian markets in the meanwhile this is festival season and because of the high volatile prices there is a latest report suggesting that the gold discount is at a seven week highs of $13 an ounce so if it is 2500 dollars indians are uh, perhaps buying it at 24 uh, you know uh, 87 or 88 uh, kind of level so there is a deep discount happening here also when you look at the indian prices itself on budget when you saw that rate cut coming in the gold prices fell all the way down to around 67000 which is gained up to 72000 right now so a 5000 rupees jump up in in matter of uh, a month or so is also led to some the weakness in sense of buying of course it's festival season going forward and the markets will pick up in that sense but at this point in time all eyes on the us data and of course the rate hike Okay, yes, we'll be watching out for that. Manisha, thank you so much for joining in with all those details. In fact, Senko Gold told us that because of the duty cut, there's been a massive increase in gold demand as well. As Manisha said, prices have increased substantially in last one month as well. Time for a short break now. Pasna Chatra, the Chief India Economist at Morgan Stanley, will join in next to discuss the FI25 outlook for India in terms of economy, inflation and GDP growth as well. Welcome back. So recently, Morgan Stanley upgraded India's FY25 GDP forecast by 20 basis points to 7%. This is post the high frequency data for the month of August, which has recorded positive growth in sequential terms after declining for the previous three consecutive months. So to talk more about this upgrade to India's economic outlook, we have with us the author of the report, Upasana Chachra, Chief India Economist at Morgan Stanley. Uh, Upasana, uh, morning and thank you for joining in. This is Reema here. So take us through the economic indicators that you've picked up recently, which makes you more bullish. And um, is this an upgrade only for FI25 or is there an upside risk to FI26 too? Hi, good morning. So on uh, GDP, what we've done is that we have uh, we have upgraded our numbers for fiscal 25 by 20 basis points to 7%. Um, uh, this was on the basis of uh, one being higher GDP growth numbers uh, that we saw for uh, the 
जून क्वार्टर नंबर सो क्वार्टर एंडिंग जून हैज बिन अ लिटिल बेटर स्पेशली इफ यू लुक एट द जी बी ए और द सप्लाई साइड ऑफ द ग्रोथ डेटा पॉइंट्स डिस्पाइट सम हेड विन्स फ्रॉम लोअर गवर्नमेंट स्पेंडिंग ड्यू टू द इलेक्शन साइकिल एज वी नो एंड ऑल्सो द लिंगरिंग इम्पैक्ट ऑफ पुअर वेदर ऑन एग्रीकल्चर ग्रोथ सो डिस्पाइट दैट जी बी ए ग्रोथ डिट सरप्राइज आर नंबर्स में अबाउट थर्टी बेसिस पॉइंट्स कमिंग एन एट सिक्स पॉइंट एट आई द सप्लाई साइड ऑफ द इकोनॉमी वॉज वेटी रोबास्ट uh and if we look at uh, now uh, you know uh, the ex forward uh, indicators for growth trajectory especially in the next three quarters i think if we were to normalize government spending from uh, just the june quarter uh, numbers uh, for the uh, for what we know from the budget we will see incrementally or sequentially the fiscal support to be better than the june quarter and also now there is greater confidence or certainty that the agriculture uh, growth would be better than last year given that the monsoon season has been pretty uh, decent and uh, crop sowing activity is also uh, picking up so in that context uh, we do see uh, we do see some uh, pick up in these driven by these two segments and also still sustaining the growth momentum across other drivers um and therefore the upgrade to fiscal 25 number so to your question uh, yes this is an upgrade to fiscal 25 right now from 6.8 to 7 uh, for the next three quarters if i have to see then the upgrade is a little bit more at about 30 basis points versus up up earlier uh, trajectory uh, currently we retain fiscal 26 at about 6 and a half Okay, uh, Upasna. Morning. In that case, uh, in the consumption basket itself, which are the major contributors? We've been talking about rural recovering, but do you think it will outpace the urban consumption, or will it remain at par? So um, yes, rural has been definitely a positive and the support factor for uh, consumption growth. And if we look at the overall consumption numbers as well, uh, private consumption uh, surprised uh, positively, I would say, in the June quarter, uh, coming in at 7.4 percent, a seven quarter high. And if we look at the previous few quarters, it was pretty dismal at about 4 percent levels. Uh, rural demand, I think, uh, uh, with, from the high frequency data, if you were to see, has been showing signs of recovery from, say, the beginning of the This year or the March quarter onwards, uh, things uh, uh, high frequency demand indicators like two wheeler sales or FMCG volume growth in rural areas versus urban areas has been picking up uh, since the March quarter. The trend has sustained in June as well. And uh, going forward, I think especially for fiscal 25, uh, farm incomes should be supported as we discussed. Uh, you know, weather has been decent and better versus last year. Uh, crop sowing is going to be higher versus last year, and therefore farm incomes should be supported. This This year versus last year, there's also support from inflation moderating on a YOI basis. Like fiscal 25 will likely be around four and a half in our view, versus close to five and a half last year. And therefore, uh, purchasing power does get supported from that trend as well. And I think uh, therefore rural demand would probably continue to outpace urban for a little bit longer, just because these tailwinds are there. And therefore, fiscal 25, I think you may continue to see this uh, play out in terms of rural sort of catching up. due to the la- uh, sluggish growth that we've seen in the last two years uh upasna what explains the drop off in india's growth rate next year versus this year next year 6.5% and this year it's 7% according to your estimate so why the decline so i would say that i wouldn't really characterize this as a decline or a major slow down i would say that um, you know india's growth on a more medium term basis would probably be somewhere between 6 and a half to 7% uh, and uh, these are more sustainable levels of growth so there will be some amount of see base effect that will play out in the next year on the agri growth numbers it could also play out a bit on like the rural demand numbers just the base effect and therefore uh, i think that shouldn't really be seen as a major slow down but just as coming to a more sustainable level now uh, obviously there are various growth uh, drivers and external demand remains a key one where there is still some uncertainty so how that plays out will finally influence the fiscal 26 numbers as well but as of now i would say that think about it more as a medium term growth handle where we, where you will see growth more trudging in the 6 and a half to 7 which is pretty robust levels Obasna now let's talk about the inflation number because uh, we are getting into the festive season as well we've been talking about how food inflation is a big uh, part 45.86% of the overall cpi basket considering that we are entering the festive season uh, what kind of inflation targets do we see will we see food prices increasing further because of the kind of environment would be in and what is your fi25 target here 
Um, so for fiscal 25, our uh, CPI inflation number is at 4.5% YOI on an average basis. Uh, for the second half, we will be going to be close to that level itself at about 45 because, you know, there's been a lot of base effect, especially in these recent readings. And we'll probably be seeing, as we saw the July print coming in at 3.5, we'll probably be seeing August also similar at 3.5, but that's mostly driven by base effect. So as you, as the base effect neutralizes, you'll probably settle at around a 4.5 level. Now, if you have to think about the drivers and especially food, as you asked, uh, food inflation, uh, has been a problem, especially trailing 12 months. We've seen food inflation spike due to the poor weather impacting, you know, the longer cropping cycle products like cereals and pulses, as well as some of the shorter cropping cycles like vegetables due to demand supply mismatch on unfavorable, you know, bouts of weather. Um, so that has been an issue. Uh, but going forward, given that sowing activity is picking up, rice sowing is up, pulses sowing is up quite meaningfully, um, you will see better crop out Output, uh, which will start kicking in from the September, October or the harvest season. And therefore, this cycle of the agriculture season, which starts from this harvest cycle and goes up to the end of the winter cropping cycle as well, uh, I think that's where we will see more uh, improvement in food inflation outlook. So I think uh, the festival season, I know, is generally characterized by some bouts of pickup in prices, especially vegetable prices. So I think that seasonal trend and can, can continue on the shorter cropping cycle products like vegetables, but uh, more uh, from, a, from a six to 12 months perspective, I think outlook on food inflation is actually better than worse uh, or improving versus last year. Uh, quick uh, answer here, Upasana. What's your uh, you know August CPI inflation print that will be out later this week, your own expectations, and when should we expect the first rate cut from the RBI? Uh, so August CPI around three and a half, uh, flattish versus July, um, you know, the base effect uh, is still playing out somewhat. And then you also have sequentially uh, better or trend in the food price basket. Um, so no, no major change in August CPI in our view. Uh, going beyond August, we see numbers reverting into the four and a half range. In terms of first rate cut, uh, so we don't have a rate cut anytime soon in our, uh, in our forecast horizon from the RBI, driven by the fact that growth is pretty robust at 7%. RBI's numbers are higher than ours at 7.2. Um, and also inflation remains above the 4% mark at 4.5. So I think with this construct of where we are seeing growth and actually and the drivers of growth remaining pretty robust and indicating a more broad-based growth recovery, um, I think the focus can sustain on ensuring that inflation aligns to the 4% mark. And therefore, in our view, probably we're not seeing rate cuts that quick if we were to okay. go wrong, I think either in uh, growth is weaker, probably driven more by the global slowdown, or global growth surprising on the demand side, or inflation coming more closer to the 4% handle. All right. Okay, Upasana, thank you so much uh, for joining in today. It was a pleasure speaking with you about a whole host of things, uh, everything macro, of course. We'll speak to you soon again. But uh, with that, we'll slip into a break. When we come back, we'll discuss market technicals with Sony Patnayak of JM Financial Services and also discuss the top trading bets. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Trading R on CNBC TV 18. It's a good time to get a technical check on the markets. It's been volatile. Yes, of course, it has recovered from the lows. Uh, let's get in Sony Patnaik from JM Financial Services for just that. Sony, good morning. Thank you so much for joining in. Well, what's the market's mood? Some recovery. We've been able to sustain that so far. Uh, but what is the next important level to watch out for? Good morning, Sonal and Reema. Thank you for having me on your show. As I think Nifty, we can see that 24,800 is trying to defend itself in today's trade. And, you know, the more it can sustain, there can be a trading range between 24,800 to 25,000 mark. So we can see a lot of aggressive call writers position themselves at 25,000. From that those levels, we can see the higher strike prices still 25,500 as well. So I think that level is going to play very important. Uh, until and unless there is not a weekly close above the 25,000 mark, 
you can see that a lot of selling pressure may continue as soon as Nifty will approach the 25,000 mark. So I think this the level to watch out for right now is 24,800 to 25,000. Uh, there's a significant shift in put prices from the 25,000 base to 24,500 on weekly basis. So any break below 24,800 will open gates for Nifty that it can test towards 24,600 to 24,500 odd levels. And that's the level to watch out for 24,800 is quite crucial. And similarly, if we talk about Bank Nifty, 51,000 mark is quite uh, aggressive when it comes to the call writers. So 51,000 is a resistance for Bank Nifty until and unless it does not cross, there can be a trading range towards 50,000 to 50,800 at max. So I think Bank Nifty is also looking quite weak. It has given a significant breakdown on weekly basis. Uh, both the indices, any, any rise towards their resistance zones can act as a supply zone from those levels. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, hi. Uh, morning. So, what would your stock calls be for today? So, Rima, I think it's best to stick to the stock strategies where we can see uh, the stocks are ex continuing to exuberate a lot of strength and above its breakout. The first breakout that we can see is in JK Cement. It is continuing to hold above a 4,600 mark. Very strong it is. In futures, one can buy JK Cement around 4,660, 4,670, keeping a stop loss of 4,570. Uh, and a positional target of 4,800 can be seen for JK Cement. Uh, the second stock pick comes in UBL, United Breweries, which has seen a bullish engulfing candle pattern today on daily charts. It has held on to a very strong support of 2030. It has bounced from those levels. So UBL one can buy it uh, on very small declines to 2050, keeping a stop loss of 2030 and a target of 2085 to 2100 can be seen. Okay, all right. Uh, Sony, thank you so much for joining in today. So those are some technical bets coming in from JM Financial Services. Let's uh, take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about market fundamentals now with Anirudh Sarkar of Quest Investment Advisors. Some interesting uh, stocks there. Uh, stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Ola Electric is under pressure. Its one-month lock-in has ended today, so there is more supply in the market. Hormis now joins in with the details. Hormis. You know, it's not been a single day since its listing on the 9th of August that Ola Electric has not been in the news. And today is exactly a month since the, or you can say the most awaited listing of the year finally happened. Uh, for that was Ola Electric. And the one month lock in period ending today, 18 crore shares become eligible for trade. Needs to be clarified here that they'll not be sold immediately, they become eligible to trade in the market. That amounts to around 4% of the company's outstanding equity. Now, Ola Electric has an IPO has also seen its ups and downs. It listed exactly at its IPO price of 76 but ended the listing day 20% higher and then had a series of upper circuits. Within six days of listing, the stock doubled from its IPO price, made a new high of around 157 and since then has been in a corrective mode and now almost down around 35% from the highs of around 157 that it had made on the 20th of August. Now, since its listing, there have been many announcements made by the company. It launched its new bike, the road, electric bike, the Roadster, on the 15th of August. It also reported its first quarter results where its net loss also widened compared to the same period last year. And it also reported a loss in market share to players like Bajaj, Hero and TVS. So that has kept the stock in news. Bhavish Agarwal was with us last week. He told us that this market share concerns will be addressed as the company increases its penetration and distribution. On the financial side, they said they are very close to the break-even on the EBITDA level is what Bhavish Agarwal told us and the uh, fundamentals of the business remain strong is what he said. Now HSBC within a day or two of its listing had come out with a note on Ola Electric with a buy rating, a price target of 140. It crossed that very soon but now it is well below that uh, price target of HSBC. It said that despite the concerns that the brokerage has over the EV penetrations and all the other headwinds, Ola Electric is still worth investing but slower penetration of EVs and the issues with regards to its battery plant remain the key downside risks for now the stock remains under pressure heading towards the mark of 100 rupees almost down 35 percent from its all-time high 
Thank you very much uh, for that. Anirudh Sarkar from Quest Investment Advisors is now with us on the show. Anirudh, uh, morning. Thank you for joining in. I know Zomato is one of your top holdings, but did you analyze Ola Electric? Uh, as Hormus was pointing out, it's fallen 35% from its recent peak. Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, so I think uh, that is one company, you know, when the company got listed, uh, we had a lot of discussions around the valuations, and I think that continues to remain a big concern that, you know, what is the right valuation for companies uh, in that space? Because uh, I'm also invested into other, the two-wheeler companies, uh, which are doing uh, exceptionally well uh, when I talk about both on the uh, IC engines and on the uh, EV. Uh, when I look at valuation of that company compared to Ola Electric, uh, it's very difficult for me to make a sense that, you know, what is the right valuation for this company? So we have avoided it uh, from the day of IPO. And even now, at, uh, after the one-month lock-in has opened, uh, we are avoiding it as of now. Okay. Uh, talking about valuations, you're avoiding Ola Electric on the back of that, but you do have some interesting names in your portfolio, uh, be it Zomato, which has run up so much in the last couple of months, be it Trent as well. That's a one-way move. Are valuations justified at current levels for these two names? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one, uh, one thing which we need to uh, keep an eye on is that is the earnings supporting the valuations. That is most important. Like if I look at, uh, you know, what has happened with a company like, uh, say, Tata Trent, uh, it's very difficult for anyone to give me a company which is growing at 55 to 65 percent Y on Y uh, with regard to its, uh, you know, uh, top line, bottom line. And uh, the amount of expansion which the company has been doing has been exceptionally um, well. I would say uh, from my initial entry point, uh, though the stock has become almost five times, but I would say uh, we continue to have it among our top three holding because uh, the management's execution quality has been impeccable with regard to uh, all the expansions which they have done. Also, the new growth area which the management is talking about, which is the Star Bazaar, that is something which we are also very, very bullish on. Uh, so we'll have to see how they are able to execute uh, all the different business verticals. Coming to Zomato, I would say, yeah. yeah, so coming to Zomato, I would say, yes, if I look at the past numbers, it looks very expensive. But if I look at where uh, the numbers can be in FI 26, 27, I would say it looks very attractive because considering the fact uh, that, you know, Blinkit, which is the big growth driver for Zomato, that will give a lot of cash flows. And uh, you'll see the numbers looking very attractive on a FI 26, 27 numbers. Hmm. Any other stocks that you guys are pushing now? where valuations are still okay, relatively attractive? So without getting the names, I would say that uh, some sectors where I feel a good amount of valuation comfort is there. One is the healthcare space. So I think pharma is one space uh, where uh, from not having any pharma stock uh, six, eight months back, we have almost six, seven percent uh, exposure to that space. Uh, along with that, we are looking at increasing exposure into the pharma and healthcare because I think uh, that gives us a good amount of opportunity with uh, what is happening in the US uh, with the most recent, the Biosecure Act. I think that opens up a lot of opportunity for Indian healthcare companies because if they want to cut down on their exposure into the Chinese uh, healthcare companies, I think uh, biggest beneficiary will be the Indian companies. So I think pharma is one space where valuation comfort is there. Uh, IT is again another space where I would say a uh, good valuation comfort is there. Uh, the very fact that uh, with the rate cuts uh, in the US likely to happen in the next couple of months, I think in the next uh, policy meet itself, we could see a rate cut. Uh, that is again going to be a very good trigger for the discretionary IT budgets, uh, which will be again good for the Indian IT companies. Okay. Anirudh, the other interesting name in your PMS is uh, TVS Holdings. Uh, you know, out of the entire holding uh, company space, you have this one stock here. Can you explain the rationale first up and what is the trigger going forward for all these holding companies? Because we do see some of the notifications that keep coming in from the regulator here. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, many of these holding companies, they have uh, excellent deep value built into it. Now, if I talk about a TVS holding, which is my, uh, you know, among my top five, top 10 holdings, I would say uh, if I look at the core underlying, so now this uh, TVS holding would have the three verticals. One is autos, uh, which is basically the holding company for TVS motors. Now, TVS holding it owns around 50% of TVS motors. And uh, where the stock trades today, uh, though the stock has given us uh, almost like 60-70% upside from our initial entry point, but I think where it stands today, it still quotes at a 55% hold co, 55 to 60% uh, hold co discount to its holding company, uh, to its holding in TVS Motors. Uh, the other two parts are, uh, it has a real estate business called Emerald Haven Realty. Uh, which is doing exceptionally well. It has already developed around 2 million square feet, another 6 million square feet is under development. 
And the third part is the NDFC business. Uh, this NDFC, which is uh, called the TVS Credit, uh, that is uh, kind of uh, a very high growth business area. A uh, TVS Motors owns around 80% into the TVS Credit. And most recently, TVS Holding, they acquired a, a NCR based uh, uh, NDFC. Uh, the combined AUM of the NDFC would be around 30,000 crore plus. I believe uh, each of these verticals, auto, the real estate, and NBFC, they are all doing exceptionally well, and it looks like a very deep value to me, even at these levels. Mm. Uh, SH Kalkar is a stock we don't often talk about, but it's a company which makes fragrances, particular for the food industry. Now, even the stock return has been subpar compared to the kind of market returns many of the mid-caps have given. I think I was looking at the five-year CAGR return. It's just about 14%. So it would have been an underperformer compared to you know many of the mid-caps. So why is it that you find it attractive? So we entered into SHK Liquor uh, around uh, six, eight months back because uh, we had the same concerns in the past that, you know, so basically the company uh, was seeing an erosion in their margins uh, because if I look at the two business verticals, the two parts of its business, the bigger part is the fragrance business. That makes up almost like, you know, 80, 85% of the business. And uh, the food business, which is the food flavor business, that is the smaller part. Now, within the fragrance, I think, uh, you know, um, fragrance typically is not used if you're, if you're not going to go out. And that was one part which got impacted during the COVID, wherein that, you know, if people are being at home, you typically won't be using the fragrance. Now, post-COVID, I would say uh, in the last 18 months, a lot of growth has picked up. A company had done a couple of acquisitions in the past overseas. And I think because of that, they are seeing now a good uh, traction in the overseas market. They got a good, decent, large order. Uh, from a global MNC uh, FMCG company, and that opens the gateways for them to tap into other FMCG companies internationally. Uh, margins have bottomed out, margins are improving. Uh, so that was one kind of uh, the inflection point which uh, gave us, uh, you know, our, an entry that, you know, the margins have uh, improved, top line growth is coming in, uh, the leverage and everything which was there in the past that is declining, and all the acquisitions are going to pay off. Uh, it's uh, the largest aromatic chemicals in the country, and I think uh, it's, again, kind of the niche play in the chemical space. Right. Anirudh, uh, it, uh, it was a great chat. Thank you so much for throwing light on different sectors and different stocks as well. We'll speak to you very soon again. That's uh, all about market fundamentals and valuations. But it's time for another break. When we come back, we'll get you more on the markets on the other side, so stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Well, the general insurance business data for the month of August is out. Yash is joining in with all those details. Yash, how did the numbers look? Well, uh, the industry is uh, slowed down a bit uh, from the performance that it was exhibiting. We saw that in the month of July and again August, uh, the numbers for the industry uh, looks like, uh, you know, the acceleration has been reducing. So the industry has grown its premium by about 4% uh, in the month of August. For the first five months of FI25, the premium growth stands at about 11%. Standalone health insurance industry, that has grown at about 25%. In the month of August, uh, up to the first five months, the growth stands at 24%. If we speak about individual players for ICICI Lombard, the August premium is up 10%, five months uh, premium is up 17%, market share gain of 59 basis points. So in a slowing down industry also, ICICI Lombard has continued to outperform the industry. New India Assurance, uh, after some bit of recovery, which we saw in the month of last, uh, in the last month, uh, growth has again contracted. So uh, August premium is down about 13%. First five months, the premium growth is just about 2% and there's a market share loss of about 108 basis points in the first five months of FI25 versus the same time last year. Go Digit General Insurance August premium has uh, slowed down considerably, a growth of just 3%. For the first five months of FI25, the growth stands at 13%, market share gain of about 6 basis points. Finally, Star Health Insurance, the August premium is up 15%. Uh, up to five months, the premium growth stands at 17%, market share gain if it has to be compared with all general insurance companies, then it's up 27 basis points in the first five months. But if one looks at only the standalone health insurance companies, then it's down about 287 basis points for Star Health Insurance. Okay, all right, Yash, thank you so much for bringing us up to speed with uh, the insurance data for the month gone by. With that, it's a wrap on Trading Hour, but stay tuned. All the market action coming up on Halftime Report that comes up next. Stay tuned.